dear colleagues and friends. On behalf of the Holberg Board, it is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this seminar in Copenhagen, the hometown of Ludwig Holberg himself. It is a great pleasure for us in the Norwegian Holberg Prize Board to come here and to host this academic event. My name is Jürgen Seierstedt, and I am the chair of the Holberg Board and professor of Nordic literature at the University of Bergen. And I would like to thank the Royal Danish Academy of Sciences and Letters for letting us hold our seminar in this esteemed institution. I also would like to thank the four excellent young scholars from the Nordic countries, three of whom are previous Nils Klim laureates, who have been willing to share their perspectives on the topic, how can local and historical knowledge contribute to rethinking current planetary issues? Please allow me first a few words in promotion of the Holberg Prize. The portfolio of the prize consists of several components. First, the main Holberg Prize of the value of 6 million Norwegian kroner is awarded to excellent scholars in the disciplines covered by the prize, which is humanities, social sciences, law and theology. One of the main ambitions of the Holberg Prize is also to inspire young scholars and to promote dialogue across different generations of researchers. The Nils Klim Prize of the value of 500,000 Norwegian kroner is therefore awarded annually to a young researcher being from or residing in a Nordic country. The prizes are awarded by the Holberg Board on behalf of the University of Bergen and on the recommendation of academic committees which consist of outstanding international scholars in the relevant academic fields. The laureates of the 2024 Holberg and Nils Klim prizes will be publicly announced on the 14th of March this year. However, for the Holberg and Nils Klim prizes of next year, we strongly encourage nominations to be submitted through the website of the Holberg Prize until the deadline of the 15th of June 2024. In addition to these prizes, we also established the Holberg Prize School Project, which is an annual research competition for students in the upper secondary schools in Norway, and where the, three, the top three contribu contributions are awarded prizes. Finally, the Holberg Prize hosts and organizes the Holberg Debate, an annual event inspired by Ludwig Holberg's intellectual curiosity, aiming to explore pressing issues of our time. Please check out our website for further information. Back to today's seminar, which is directly related to the Nils Klim Prize, and where there will be exciting perspectives from four well-qualified contributors. I now hand the floor to Professor Dr. Stavnes of Aarhus University, member of the Nils Klim Committee, who will moderate the event. Please, Doctor. Thank you. Thank you, Jörn, and uh, for this introduction. And uh, let me motivate uh, the discussion that we have today. So, the planet is burning, rain, hot rain is pondering the earth, epidemics are widespread, wars are thought, fists are gasping for oxygen, lava and polluted soil is, bur is burying villages, societies are divided by new forms of populism on the rise, Children's well-being is on the decline. The number of forced migrants is exploding due to politics on resources, forest and land. And communities of exile and diaspora are growing. The list of geopolitical problems and local suffering is extensive, and its scale seems to be worldwide. In addition, and perhaps as frightening, it seems as if we are running out of suggestions for understanding and intervening, counter-narratives and affirmative critiques are therefore urgently needed. Instead of either shying away from these questions or suggesting to colonize the moon, which some people think that we should, this symposium aims to stay with the trouble, as Donna Haraway says, and land on the earth for intense in distinct part of the world, people continue to do important things worthy of our attention. The entanglement of local and the planetary, the now past and future, needs reconsideration. 
one way ahead is to ask if and how local and indigenous situated and historical knowledges may serve as pre uh, uh, precious frameworks and tools that could assist us in understanding and in living in the current time and nurturing the diversity in a livable and responsible way. The idea here today is not simply to go back to ways of thinking and handling originating in the past. Neither is the goal to suggest an extractive practice where ancient or indigenous communities, cosmologies, and habits are conceived as just another resource to tap on or tap into. Rather, the aim today if in, at uh, this discussion is to consult local knowledge production and historical event in their own rights and as inspiring counter-narratives to global or worldwide principles uh, celebrated for the interpretive repertoire of modernity. So this seminar invites four excellent young scholars from the Nordic countries in, to reflect upon how the local knowledges that they have encountered and the different geographical and historical spaces in which um, they have conducted research may contribute to inspire us critically and with ethico-political approaches toward planetary problems and to contribute to planetary rethinking and solutions to planetary problems. We ask today, how can local and historical knowledge contribute to rethinking current planetary issues? How may our critiques of the current here and now be informed by other times, other places, other cosmologies, and alternative epistemologies? How may we foster inspiration, ethical collaboration, and exchange across different times, different spaces, and thereby recenter the epistemic spaces of the present? So that is the frame of it. And we have invited, as I said, three, uh, four excellent scholars, three former Nils Klim uh, award, uh, awarded scholars, and uh, one that couldn't be awarded because she's not into humanities and, and social sciences, but if we could, we would probably have done it. <laughs> so uh, the first one is Frederik Poulsen. He is Associate Professor of the Old Testament in the Faculty of Theology at the University of Copenhagen. And his research interests include migration and diaspora in the Bible, the prophetic literature, uh, biblical theology, and reception. In 2020, he was rewarded the Nils Klim Prize and the Royal Danish Academy of Science and Letters Silver Medal. And currently, he is a Sapira Auder, a DFF uh, research leader of the project Divergent Views of Diaspora in the Asian Judaism. Secondly, we will uh, listen to Elisa Ushimaki in the 2020, uh, or she is, the 2022 Nils Klim Laureate and works on the literary and cultural history of Judaism in, in the antiquity. She hails from Finland, um, but has been based in Denmark since 2020 at my university. And currently she serves there as a professor at the School of Culture and Society. She's also the PI of the ERSC project, an intersectional analysis of ancient Jewish travel narratives. She has published on topics such as early Jewish wisdom literature, lived ancient religion, gender, and intersectionality. And then we have Avjaya uh, Lubert Hauptmann. She's Inuit from Greenland and Danish, and trained as a biologist from the University of Copenhagen. She has a speciality in microbiology and a PhD from the Technical University of Denmark. Uh, at the moment, she is assistant professor at Ilisu Matsufik, the University of Greenland, as well as at the, uh, the Global Institute. Her work resolves around the microbial and human cultures of Greenlandic food, relationships with the environment, the history and ourselves through food and microbes. And then we have Simona in the end, Simona Sederberg Nielsen. She is Associate Professor of Scandinavian Literature at Aarhus University. And she got the Nils, Krim, uh, Nils Klim Prize in 2023. And she has just, very impressively, defended her, uh, not PhD, but the Danish doctoral thesis, which is something completely different. Uh, where she works with the archive of uh, 77 novels from the 18th century. 
So as you can hear, we really have the cream of everything here. And I'm really looking forward to this exciting lineup and to talk and discuss with you. So welcome. And um, let's begin with you, Frederick. And you will be talking about eco-dependent, uh, the Bible on humans and nature. As a proud recipient of the Nils Kleen Prize 2020, I am most grateful for taking part in this academic event. My research focuses on the Old Testament, or the Hebrew Bible, and in my talk, I'll draw your attention to different perspectives on humans and nature 2,500 years ago. The climate crisis has urged us to reflect on our place in the world. And throughout history, Christianity, especially in its Western form, has shaped the perception of humans as the center of the universe. The illustration of creation here is from 1483 and is made by Anton Koberger for one of the first German translations of the Bible. Uh, notice the four winds. Uh, the sun and the moon, and earth as the center. We see God the, God the Almighty, his creative spirit, and the creation of Eve in the Garden of Eden. I also like this illustration uh, because I have a six-year-old daughter, and uh, like anyone else in her age, she just loves magical beings. And please notice here in the ocean... We have a small mermaid, and just next to the trees, a unicorn. Koberger's illustration certainly reflects the worldview of its time and stresses the significance of humans. It accords with the anthropocentric view that we find in the book of Genesis and its first chapter about creation. It is the one about the six days, and humans being created in the image of God and as rulers of all animals. A central element is God's command in verse 28. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Humans are rulers, set over against all animals. Some scholars have argued that this verse in particular belongs to the historical roots of our ecological crisis. As it for centuries has legitimized colonization, I mean fill the earth, and exploitation. This may be so historically, but the meaning of the command does not necessarily contain such negative implications. For instance, how do you rule a fish? More likely, the statement urges humans to take responsibility for nature, to keep it and protect it. The humans in the creation account are thus better seen as caretakers rather than oppressive masters just like a shepherd taking care of his flock or a king protecting his people. Interestingly, this interpretation occurs in the most recent Danish Bible translation, which speaks about responsibility, ansvar for, instead of dominion, herske, herdømme. Regardless of the way we translate it, however, the book of Genesis does emphasize the central role of humans in creation. An opposite view is found in the book of Job. The story short, a rich and righteous man, Job, suffers great losses. 
His property is stolen, his beloved children die, and he is affected by serious illness. He ends up among the ashes, scraping himself with a pot's hurt. Three friends arrive, and chapter after chapter, they discuss the sufferings of Job. Are good and evil distributed in the world in a just manner? Is, do, is God doing his job in a satisfying way? Not according to Job. He calls on God to come to court and accuses him of not doing right. The most surprising feature is that at the end of the book, God does show up and speaks to Job out of a storm. Here illustrated by William Blake in the early 19th century. Nevertheless, God does not answer Job's call for justice. Rather, he points to the greatness of creation and the insignificance of humans. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? And God continues talking about controlling the sea, the rain, the stars, the wild animals, and monstrous creatures like Leviathan and Behemoth. Given the magnitude of this God-created universe, humans and their alleged problems are insignificant. There are two perspectives here that are worth reflecting on. One, we live in a world that is not perfect. Evil exists, accidents happen, and there are apparently chaotic and destructive forces that not even God is in complete control of. Second, we as humans are not responsible for everything that happens in the world. We are subject to certain limitations, and there are many things that we cannot change, even if we wanted to. A third and more ecocentric view is found in the Book of Psalms. Psalm 104 praises God, the world, its harmony and beauty, life-giving water, birds, and animals. What is striking according to this psalm is that humans are just one species among many, part of nature, not in control of it. Verses 19 to 23 address God. You have made the moon to mark the seasons. The sun knows its time for setting. You make darkness and it is night when all the animals of the forest come creeping out. The young lions roar for their prey, seeking their food from God. When the sun rises, they withdraw and lie down in their dens. People go out to their work and to their labor until the evening. According to these verses, people, or humans, are not something special. They are part of a fine-tuned machine or clock and serve a specific function during the day, just like other creatures do during the night. In general, Psalm 104 wants us to see nature as a gift from God and discover again and again the richness and diversity of life. This may be a word of comfort for many of us who are currently sad and pessimistic due to the climate and lack of political action. Yes, we need to do more, but we must never forget to make room for astonishment and joy for the world that actually exists. As the psalmist concludes, O Lord, 
How manifold are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. Thank you. Thank you very much, Frederik Paulsen, for this interesting talk. And now, Elisa Uzumaki, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the generous invitation to take part in this timely seminar. Thank you also for taking your time to attend this event. Various questions concerning human mobility have occupied us recently because of grave reasons such as COVID-19, climate concerns, and the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. We also travel because of work and leisure to gain knowledge and to spend time with our families and for many other reasons. As an area of research, travel has enjoyed growing attention in recent decades. It is now clear that people, ideas, and objects have always been in motion, whether the question is about random visits, short trips, or migrations. In fact, travel is the very first human condition. At the dawn of history, the historian Eric Lee writes, humans were migratory animals. The condition of being attached to a single place and the related notion of a localizable home developed only later. In my research, I explore representations of travel in ancient Jewish writings with a focus on how gender and other intersecting differences shape and condition human mobility. I do so because our imagination of ancient travel continues to be colored by male celebrities. Many famous texts narrate journeys of men such as Sinuhe, Gilgamesh, Abraham, and Odysseus. Scholars have contrasted the masculine logic of mobility with the feminine logic of cecility, using the botanical image of being permanently planted. To be sessile means to remain home, a role assigned to Penelope and many others, which makes travel a gendering activity. Since antiquity, it has served as a medium of male immortalities by enabling conquerors, explorers, and others to acquire transformational experiences on the move. Yet such a notion of travel history remains partial and problematic. In my sources, various social realities prompt, enable, or compel a range of travel experiences. Elite men appear in the record, and some travel out of curiosity or personal will, but a great deal of the movers are slaves, war captives, forced migrants, refugees, prides, or economic migrants relocating due to an env environmental crisis. The sources are sparse and many questions remain unanswered, but the sum of sporadic ex evidence urges us to form a more nuanced notion of the past, regardless of how local and minor women's travel, for instance, may have been from the viewpoint of those in power. Investigating movers forgotten in traditional history writing helps us resist romantic notions of travel that prioritize the movement of privileged cosmopolitans and to deconstruct modern Western associations of travel with freedom, pleasure and escape from necessity while neglecting its great ambiguity. Yet my sources also shed light on more voluntary forms of travel, which are both ubiquitous and a subject of debate in our world today. In this regard, I'd like to draw attention to my recent article on travel and anxiety. Drawing on affect studies, I argue that early Jewish writings reveal travel-related anxieties, including both explicit emotions, rational fears and worries, and more unspoken and fuzzy feelings of anxiety, indicating uncertainties and the anticipation of negative consequences. Narratives depict acute and personal forms of anxiety, whereas instructions tend to address more chronic types of anxiety revolving around certain societal phenomena. Aspects of ancient travel-related anxiety may be of interest to us because of our own anxieties related to travel. For instance, as for the topic of our seminar today, we know the CO2 consequences of our choices, but most of us are ignorant when we should do something. For instance, stop or at least radically decrease flying. It seems difficult to imagine a world in which we would not move around and to give up travel practices to which we are used. As someone once put it, 
with the middle class know, but do not appreciate our knowledge when it comes to travel and climate issues. While every society and period have their own issues, we are not the first ones to consider the ethical dimension of travel. One ancient text I wish to highlight and discuss today is written by the Jewish philosopher Philo of Alexandria, who lived and wrote in one of the major cultural and intellectual centers of the Mediterranean world in the early first century CE. In his work, Philo recognizes the benefits of travel in search of wisdom and knowledge. He notes how one's desire to know may require taking a boat and traveling to the ends of the earth, despite the dangers and challenges of such a voyage. He mentions how many have come to a wiser mind by leaving their country, and he explains how some travel for their love of culture, thus acquiring knowledge that benefits and pleases the soul. Yet Philo also condemns a certain type of travel, in his view, the soul of the bad man focuses on his earthly body and its pleasures, as opposed to the cultivator of the soul. He illustrates this distinction by two biblical figures, Cain the worker and Noah the cultivator, and by interpreting the earth as referring to the body and its pleasures. When explaining the allegorical meaning of Cain, Philo criticizes his travel that aims at increasing this worldly pleasure and profit. Quote, it is in fact the case that the soul of the bad person is concerned with nothing else than the body made of earth and all the body's pleasures. The great crowd of people who traverse the regions of the earth and reach its very limits, cross the high seas, search the depths of the sea, and leave no part of the whole unexplored. Such people are continually and everywhere engaged in providing those things which enable pleasure to be increased. Indeed, they mine the earth and traverse the high seas and perform all the deeds of peace and war supplying generous amounts of material for pleasure as if for a queen. They are uninitiated in the skill of cultivating the soul, which sows and plants the virtues and harvests from them a happy life as their crop." End quote. Philo presents the greedy masses' travel in contrast to soul cultivation. Their trips aim at finding lavish materials and goods such as precious metals and special kinds of food that enable pleasure and will generate profit because of appealing to the senses. While other ancient sources connect Rome, the center of the empire where people displayed wealth and performed power with the acquisition of luxury goods, Philo talks more generally about the limits of the earth. Such trips, he argues, are not sustainable and indicate a lack of consideration for true priorities, as well as an ignorance of soul cultivation, the core human task. People embarking on such journeys are yet to discover a way of life not driven by an attempt to maximize pleasure which may even cause warfare, as is suggested by the bleak reference to performing all the deeds of peace and war. Philo writes in a period when travel increased and facilitated amassing great wealth. His criticism must be rooted in his own encounters and experiences. In my article, I ask why Philo assesses and instructs against greedy travel, and I argue that he is anxious in the sense of feeling apprehension and anticipating negative consequences caused by the presumed harmful effects of pressure on one's well-being. Philo is pessimistic about the outcomes of lifestyle choices, ignoring soul cultivation, which he sees as the supreme goal of the human life. It has been observed that Philo's negative assessment of pleasure resembles diatribes, popular speeches promoting restrained manners. I'd like to add that, in terms of its theme, the text can also be compared to other Greco-Roman texts objecting to types of travel. According to Horace, one's happiness depends on one's state of mind. A mere change of climate is not enough, as reason and wisdom, not a seaside location, quell one's worries. Seneca, too, asks what profit there is in crossing the sea or chasing the city, since an escape from one's troubles requires not another place or but, but another personality. He criticizes aristocrats who travel as a cure for discontent when one should focus on removing the burdens of the mind. Likewise, Epictetus urges one to find peace in their place of residence instead of imagining an alternative lifestyle in another city. The foci of critique are different. Horace, Seneca, and Epictetus criticize leisure trips of the wealthy who travel as a cure for discontent or to, dis to escape from troubles, while Philo questions travel driven by material creed. Instead of trips of those who struggle with finding a purpose for their lives, 
Philo is concerned with another phenomenon and what it facilitated in his society. Luxury that detracts one from the good life in which self-control is decisive. Despite the different objects of the author's criticism, it is remarkable that the Greco-Roman intelligentsia seems to have been more broadly concerned with the ethics of travel in case it lacked what they saw as a good purpose. To conclude, people have always been on the move for better or worse. Ancient authors portray mobility as integral to human culture, showing that people groups have never been isolated from each other. They approve how travel can add to one's knowledge and understanding, but also occasionally pause to think about its motives and worth, not shying away from considering related problems. In so doing, the ancient writings perhaps urge us to stop and ask, do our journeys benefit or harm ourselves, our communities, our societies, and the earth? Thank you for your attention. Thank you to Elisa. And now um, I'll invite you, Aviara, help him. You go help one into the, to the floor. The floor is yours. It's mine. Thank you, daughter. <laughs> thank you, daughter, and thank you to the organizers for inviting me here today. It's been a real pleasure for me to get this opportunity to reflect on historical and local encounters that have shaped my work and also actually how I view the world today. Here we go. So I come from a classical training in microbiology and biotechnology. And these local and historical encounters have shaped my work so much today that I no longer work with microbiology alone. I work with Arctic indigenous people's food systems from an interdisciplinary angle. And I would like to present today two encounters. One historical encounter and one local encounter that have shaped my work, starting with this historical encounter. And as you might imagine, as a microbiologist, reading historical literature is not part of my everyday work. But for the past years, after I've moved back to my home country of Greenland, historical literature has become part of my work. And I've chosen a historical encounter that I continue to come back to. And it's this quote, by Danish ethnographer Kai Birgit Smith. And if you don't mind, I would like to read it aloud. And I invite you to either listen to me read it or uh, read it and close your ears, because it's very hard to do both at once. Um, so the quote goes, if their, it's talking about Inuit, if their logic differs from ours, and there's no doubt that to a certain extent it does, the reason is another and much deeper one. They do not recognize any clean-cut boundary between what is natural and what is supernatural. No other concepts entirely intellectual, but always confused with emotion and volition. This does not mean that they are incapable of logical thinking, but it often gives their thoughts a mystic tinge, foreign and even incomprehensible to us. Here a single example will suffice. A polar Eskimo explained why the bear hunt had failed in the following manner. There are no bears because there's no ice, and there's no ice because there's no wind. And there's too much wind because we have offended the powers. Thus, the illogical element only turned up in his train of thought when his experience failed. So there are two things that I would like to highlight with this quote. One thing is that, to me, it reflects a tension that we still experience today between what we might call Western scientific ways of thinking and indigenous ways of thinking. And this tension exists despite the fact that what the quote also teaches us is that polar bear hunters have known that our minds and our behaviors are connected to the weather for much longer time than science has known this. And this understanding is something that is embedded in our language. In Galatlisut, in Greenlandic, this is reflected by the word sila. Sila means the weather, but sila also means mind and world order. It also means spirit of the wind. And sila mi, to be in sila, means to be outside. Sila miu, to be from sila means to be human. 
Silah Suak, the great Sila means world. And Silah Suak mute, those who are from the great Sila, is humanity. What is in this word is that climate and mind and behavior and planet are the same thing. And what we can learn from the worldview that this reflects is that when we're dealing with climate change, we're dealing with changes that have happened in our minds and our behaviors. So when we want to deal with climate change, we need to think about how our minds are, how our behavior is, and maybe change those. And it's my belief that to make these changes, scientific knowledge will not be enough. And then I would like to move on to a local encounter that I've been very privileged to have. In 2019, I traveled to the northernmost permanently populated place on Earth. It's called Siura Baduk. It's a settlement in northern Greenland. And I was traveling there to do research on a fermentation practice of seabirds, so a local food custom. And when I was in Siura Baduk, I met this lady. This is Bashok. And Pastok um, was kind enough and honest enough to teach me that very often in the work that we do and how we approach the world, we have a choice between approaching the world from a deficit-based perspective or what we might call a strength-based perspective. A deficit-based perspective is something that we're often trained to take as scientists. We want to have, or we don't want them, but we look for problems. We look for issues. We look for some of the crises in the world that our knowledge can solve. And then we apply our scientific knowledge to solve them. That feels great because that makes us useful in the world. A strength-based perspective looks for strengths and positive things that exist in the world that might help us solve problems. So... In my work with fermentation practices, I could take a deficit-based perspective and say, well, these fermentation practices are highly uncontrolled, and there might be some risks here that I could solve as a microbiologist. Or I can recognize that people have made this fermentation practice for centuries and know their world and they have a lot of knowledge, local knowledge, indigenous knowledge that I don't have, and I have something to learn from them. So for me, working with a strength-based perspective allows me to have a lot of hope, because when I engage with indigenous food practices, I'm trying to learn what kind of knowledge exists there. And hopefully from the historical example, with the example of Sila, I have convinced you that there are people out there in the world who have other ways of being in this planet, other ways of seeing this planet that could give us a lot of hope for humanity. And I believe that this type of hope is what current youth today and also future generations need if they are to deal with the crisis that we face. Thank you very much for giving me the space here today. Thank you, Aviaya, for these insights. We will come back to that, as with the rest. Now we have our final speaker. It is Simona Sederberg Nielsen. Welcome. The floor is yours. Thank Bjorn Ingen Bertelsen, the Holberg Committee, and the Nils Klim Committee, so much for inviting me to this important symposium and to my fellow speakers for your very insightful talks. I want to begin by saying that I'm not an expert on contemporary planetary issues. My field is literary history and fiction studies. Right now, I'm launching a project where we are arguing for the interconnections between science and fiction. And tomorrow, I will be opening Center for the Rise of Science and Fiction. The relationship between these fields, which are usually considered quite separate, is the background for my talk today. 
I will use my historical knowledge as point of departure for addressing contemporary planetary issues, and the key problem I will be centering on is that of the Anthropocene, that is, the era in which humans have become an ecological force who has impacted the planet irrevocably. We often take for granted that when we are talking about nature, we all agree what we are referring to. But our concept of nature is shaped by the contextual and historical knowledge we bring with us. Is urban nature nature? Is Louis XIV's garden nature? And why do we image a Danish forest like this? When in majority, when the majority of Danish trees look like these? The broad answer is that our conception of nature is to a large extent informed by our cultural and historical heritage, including literature and fiction. And so are our ways of acting or failing to act. In the field of literature, a special strand devoted to the study of green fiction has emerged in recent decades, namely eco-criticism. I am part of a team who is trying to write a green literary history, re-evaluating literary history through an ecological perspective. Even if eco-criticism is a response to the current global ecological crisis, it is also looking to the past, inquiring if we might find a useful approach to nature in former times. Eco-criticism has sought and found an ecological consciousness to aspire to in one particular period, namely Romanticism, and especially in Romantic poetry. The reason why an ecological movement would find affirmation in the Romantic era seems obvious. Romanticism offers a vision of a fusion of nature and humans, and pastoral poetry in particular reflects sensory meetings between the human and the non-human nature. Even if you're not an art historian or literary theorist, romantic imagery of people and nature in a joint picaresque setting like this might come to mind by the bare mentioning of the term romanticism. And when reading poems by the celebrated romantic poets, it becomes even more understandable why an ecological movement would seek inspiration and affirmation in this period. William Wordsworth is an often celebrated poet within the eco-critical movement, and his 1804 poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, is an incarnation of romantic nature poetry. In the poem, the lonely poet meets a field of daffodils that he compares to the starry night sky. And in so doing, he connects the earthly with the heavenly. In the end of the poem, the beautiful nature vision populates his inner eye, and he concludes, and then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. A natural phenomenon engulfs the human senses moves into both his consciousness and unconscious state of being, and feels it with overwhelming emotions. What could be far remote from container ships and pollution than the dance of the daffodils? The art and literature of the Romantic period offers a unity of nature and humans which we have lost and forgotten today but which should be cultivated for us to really understand nature. This is an argument of the eco-critical movement. If eco-criticism finds an answer to our approach to nature in Romanticism, it blames the preceding century for what went wrong. The 18th century is accused of initiating the divide between humans and nature, for giving rise to the industrialization, expansion politics, imperialism, and the domination of science. It is just as easy to understand 
while the Enlightenment serves as an image of the enemy for the ecocritical movement, and it is to realize the appeal of romanticism. However, the man-nature dichotomy is no 18th century invention. It can be traced back to at least the Old Testament, testimony, as we just heard, where man is told to rule over the animals and authorized to name them. The 18th century saw the dawn of industrialization, but it was only really pushed forward in the following century, and the age of the Enlightenment was indeed a time of expansion politics and colonization, but unfortunately far from the only one. It is important to acknowledge the many wrongdoings that took place in the 18th century and in other parts of our history. But my proposal today is that we run the risk of a one-sided approach to ecology if the source of our inspiration is grounded in one period only. The unity-seeking approach to nature to which romantic poetry is the model is but one out of many ideas of nature and it is not in itself enough when trying to solve the contemporary ecological crisis. So my proposal is that the Enlightenment might provide a new outlook on contemporary planetary issues. An often repeated argument against the Enlightenment is inspired by Adorno and Horkheimer, who proposed that the Enlightenment led to an overemphasis of science and a disenchantment of the world. The argument goes that the world lost its charming wonders and fairy tales and that nature became dead and instrumentalized once science took over the human mentality in the Enlightenment period. But the charming wonders and fairy tales also includes sea monsters, headless humans, angels who came with punishments, witches and devils. The transformation that took place in and around the Enlightenment period was a change from a belief in a magical religious worldview in which answers to phenomena in nature were sought in God or magical powers to a world that could be explained by empirical science. This transition did not happen overnight, but it was so fundamental that several scholars have maintained that the changes should rightfully be called a revolution. The consequences of the scientific revolution around the 18th century were a completely new worldview which made superstition obsolete, ultimately put an end to witch hunts and led to an improvement of the lives of many people. The view on nature we get from looking to the 18th century may not be one of a complete unity between humans and the rest of the natural world, but one in which science went to the forefront. In the very first novel written in the Enlightenment by a Danish-Norwegian author, and the one that has given names the prize that is the occasion for this seminar today, Ludwig Holberg's Nils Klim, a planetary issue literally constitutes the frame of the narrative. The very first thing that meets the eye of the reader is this drawing of the planet. If you look closer, you will notice that there is a person who is falling into the earth without qualifications or experiences. The main character of the novel decides to undertake a geological explanation of the bedrock of Bergen but instead of finding a natural explanation for the steams that ascend from a mountain cave, Nils Klim falls into a hole in the cave and disappears into the earth. The novel is a parody of an irrational and unscientific approach to the planet. The encounter with the earth is not one that appeals to the senses as much as to sense-making. Many subsequent 18th century fictions followed Holbeck's lead in making fun of superstition and warning against pseudo-scientific enterprises. My argument today is that the approach to nature that appeared around the Enlightenment, one that shunned superstition, promoted science, and advanced an idea of nature that was not governed by any other powers than that of the natural laws, 
is exactly what should be the driving force of an ecological consciousness today, and fiction can show us how. Even if I am only speaking of the approach to ecology within literary studies, I believe the points have larger ramifications for the system of thoughts that govern our approach to the greatest planetary issue today. Our readings of the planet we inhabit, be it of the culture, of nature, of scientific reports, or human activities, are influenced by our historical outlook, by arts, literature, and fiction. And so I call for a broader spectrum of references in the approach to eco-criticism and an engagement with art, literature, and global outlooks that are not filtered through the ideas of romanticism. If we acknowledge that we are in the Anthropocene, the era where humans have become a geological force, it is due time that we resort to our most forceful resources, reason, knowledge and science, and the Enlightenment era is the starting point for understanding how to do so. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Simona, and thank you to all four of you. We are now going into the panel discussion, and I think we're going to have some tables up here. We will come one by one. Are we only having one table? Good. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, thank you again, and uh, I think I will start uh, asking the last speaker, Simona, so I'll do it the other way around here. So thank you, Simona, again for this uh, very uh, thought-provoking talk and for the very elegant way that you, you took Nils Klim into, uh, into the talk. I enjoy that. Um, let me begin by asking you to elaborate a bit upon your concept on fiction and fictionality more broadly. As, as I remember it when reading your work as part of uh, doing our nomination work for the Nils Klim Prize, um, you wrote something I remember like, fictionality is the intended signaled intervention in communication. Do you remember that quote? Like, yeah, yeah. And, and I wondered... Um, in these also very post-factual times and times of conspiracy theories and ideas about fake news and so on, what fiction and fictionality might add to a discussion on, on climate change and climate disasters and climate catastrophes, and, and how to deal with, with science as your center is going to do. So, um, um, for instance, when climate disbelievers may say, well, that's just fiction, or uh, it's not it, it's not uh, scientifically claimed enough, uh, or when when someone says, "Well, I'm still skeptical," or "I'm I'm still not believing," I'm critical, or when Trumps talk about fake news. I remember you also s talked about that. So so these are just some examples of of epistemologies that changes hands, in a sense, and is used for the opposite of what its origin had in mind. So, so, so what may fictionality, as, as you have been talking about it, how may fictionality add to this discussion? And, and, and um, what kind of things do we need to think about when we're using this concept? Thanks. Um, so, so the important distinction here for me is to say that fiction is actually on the same side as fact and truth and science. And this is also one of the things we're going to um, investigate in, in uh, the center um, that fiction and science were actually in the 18th century kind of on the same side and trying to promote each other, so to speak. Uh, so fictional writers uh, like Holberg 
um, could actually use his uh, novel to promote uh, ideas of science and go against uh, lies and the uh, pseudo ideas of uh, of science that that were not um, that were not right. Uh, and today, I think the the concept is also very useful because um, when we say so, the news are just fictions or the ideas of, of the climate changes are just fictions. Uh, that is kind of a wrong interpretation of what's at stake. Uh, and, and when saying that it's fiction, it's kind of collapsing a lot of different uh, concepts that uh, that are not the same. So there are possibilities of us as human beings to lie. We can say something that we believe is untrue. Then we can say something that we believe to be true. But we can also use fictional means to communicate both truths and lies. So fiction for me is very importantly something different than, than lies, uh, and it is often at the same time um, a, a way of, of communicating about uh, truthfulness and, and science. It was so in the 18th century, and it's, it still is um, in many instances um, today. Mm. And, and this intervention in this dichotomy is exactly what you're uh, approaching with your science and uh, fiction in your, in your new center, isn't exactly, it? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> Usually, uh, science and fiction are, are seen as quite uh, separate, um, or it is seen as science fiction as a uh, science fiction as a subgenre of uh, the novel. Uh. But here, we're trying to investigate exactly, as you say, the relationship between science uh, and fiction. We do so in the 18th century, but uh, the, the broad idea is to um, follow it up uh, all the way through uh, to today. I hope maybe we will be able to see how uh, important it is uh, to keep the notions of science and, and fiction mm -hmm. and their uh, historical uh, importance um, as an important factor of today as well. Mm. Donna Haraway, as I mentioned in the beginning, yeah, saying that yeah. the trouble is exactly on some of the same lines here. So that's, that's interesting that there is this uh, line back and forth here. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I think it has recently been realized that fiction might also be an important tool when communicating science in, in, in various fields, and I think she's a, a good example of, of yeah. uh, trying um, to do so. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Thank you very much, Simona. Yeah, I think I will invite uh, Aviaya into the discussion. Um, also, thank you for your very inspiring talk, and um, I think you're, you're educated in the natural sciences, but very importantly for, for, for this discussion that we are having right now and for today's discussion, you are indeed working very interdisciplinary um, and often with people from, uh, from science and technology studies and with education and, and, and people with indigenous knowledges. Uh, and, and I will argue that you're brilliant. You show how issues of history, of culture, of fiction, to use that word, um, how that is interwoven into the ways that research in the natural sciences could take place and are taking place and thereby diversifying the epistemologies of, of, of the natural sciences. So in, in prolongation of this, if you can follow me here, in, in prolongation of this. Sorry, yeah. Uh, I, I have two. Mm -hmm. I have two intertwined thoughts that I would like you to reflect a bit further upon. And the first one is about um, how the natural sciences in general have difficulties incorporating, for instance, indigenous epistemologies, cosmologies, knowledges, and that the epistemic diversity conducted by by, uh, by, 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 by different people is, is, is very difficult to bring in, and it, all, it, it often hampers some kind of, some kind of unease to do that. Mm -hmm. so, so how do you build up, and how do you nature space in research in, my, in the research in, environment for actually listening to this kind of, of, of voices or, mm -hmm. and knowledges? Yeah. So I think what, um, I'm not sure if the mic is on. I hope the sound is okay. Yeah. Um, so as I said, there's this tension. And I think that in the natural sciences, because of the history, because of what Simona has been talking about, there is an idea that science is sort of the way that, that ultimately we can understand the world. And the way that in, in sort of early phase where indigenous knowledge and science interact, it's very much about how can we then with science um, prove what indigenous people say. 
Mm. Um, but what I hope that we can move towards is an understanding both within the scientific community and, and much broader is that as scientists, we also bring a worldview. Um, we are not clear from a worldview, and I was not trained to see that as a scientist, but when you go into community, when you are an indigenous person, and you see science used to describe something from a very one-sided angle that lacks some very obvious nuances, it becomes very clear that science does not understand everything, mm. that scientists bring <clears throat> their worldview into things. And so it's, I think, with time, when we also diversify the types of scientists that interact in the world, we will also have more nuanced science mm. um, that can actually work, as I said, maybe from more strength-based perspectives mm. and not just deficit-based perspectives. Mm. I hope that answers a little bit. That, that answers really good, and it, it actually brings me to, the, to, to my next question for you, which is about education. Because as you said before, you were not educated like that. That was something that you put on further. And, and I know that in the moment you're working on a new BA program on uh, biology. Mm -hmm. So how do you bring this knowledge that you just presented into the program? Mm -hmm. um, and how, do you, how, how does this knowledge ask for another way, perhaps, of structuring education and uh, educational mm -hmm. yeah, uh, programs, lessons, mm -hmm. et cetera? Thank you for that question, too. So I'm very privileged, as you know, uh, to be leading a process to build a new biology program in Greenland. And uh, the program is reflected well in this concept of SILA that I just presented. We call it the SILA program, SILA mm. Bachelor in Biology. And the way that SILA uh, is used in our program is that we, of course, as a biology program situated in the Arctic, will have to deal a lot with climate change. Our students will be experiencing climate change in their daily lives. We can see it right outside the university. So that is, of course, a theme that we deal with. But we also deal with the minds of our students. It's very important to us that our students are not just presented with all of this crisis and that we don't take responsibility for ensuring that we give them everything we can to support their mental health, um, because that is a big need at all universities. It's a very big need among students who are interested in climate change and uh, the environment. So we deal with both the mind and the weather of SILA. And one of the ways that we deal with mental health is to be SILA me, to be in the outside. So I'm fortunate to be creating a biology program, so it's obvious that we can learn a lot from being outside, especially because we're in Greenland. Um, so those are some of the ways that we're working with this, and it's also an interdisciplinary program. So the whole structure, we've actually taken the liberty to break down academic silos that are usually um, conventionally used in biology programs, so that we don't have a course in genetics but we have a course in the caribou, which is an important animal for us. We have a course in the seal. And then as part of that course, we'll learn biology. Yeah. Thank you. Thank as you, you can hear, there is a lot of things that, that I would love to ask you about. And I will open for the audience in a few minutes. But I also want to put up some questions for, for the two of you here. And what you said, Avi, about educating the mind is maybe one of the questions that I have for you, Elisa. And um, one of the topics of the Anthropocene that, that, that you have mentioned very briefly in your talk and that I really would, would like you to elaborate a bit upon is the role of the ecological crisis in, in moving people, moving their bodies, but also moving their minds. Mm -hmm. And um, I wondered if there is in your material, mm -hmm. in, for instance, all the small leather uh, things, that, that uh, the leather fragments that you are able to read. I'm not. I, it's impressive. Um, is there anything in, in, in your material that uh, we may learn from about people who moved or migrated uh, due to ecological, e ecological catastrophes or epidemics like the plague? Is there something about how they live that reality, how it formed their selves, mm -hmm. um, their future visions, their ethics? 
Do you memorize yeah. anything about if and how this uh, material mm -hmm. go about issues of, of exactly educating the self in a different way? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, of course, when we're talking about the ancient Eastern Mediterranean region, a very arid region, so famines, for instance, would have been a relatively common ecological crisis prompting movement and economic migration, uh, people moving around in order to survive. And this is also something biblical narratives, for instance, reflect. So to take a few examples, the Book of Ruth tells about a family that moves between Bethlehem and Judah and Moab on the other side of the Dead Sea. And um, we have also the, book, uh, the story about the time of Sarah and Abraham in Egypt in the Book of Genesis, right after Abraham has moved from Mesopotamia to Canaan. Um, he continues the trip with Sarah, and these are quite, you know, lacanic narratives as is typical of the, of the Hebrew Bible, but they do tell us, some, tell us something about the economic migration experience caused by, a, by an environmental um, disaster. So in both um, stories, for instance, the, uh, yeah, it becomes clear that family members um, either but their families um, or husband in the case of uh, the story about Abraham and Sarah or or the mother-in-law in the case of uh, Ruth. So another family member makes use of uh, the physical attractiveness of the, of the woman of the family in order to um, secure the finances um, of the family in a, in a foreign land, uh, in a vulnerable uh, situation. So certainly these narratives invite us to reflect on the, the social, economic um, yeah, dimensions of the experience and also inequalities and power relations within the family structure, but there could also be something more existential. For instance, in the book of Ruth, um, Ruth is said to uh, adopt the Elohim, God's ancestors of her mother in La Naomi. So uh, I think that that's also an indication of how, yeah, movement may also result in, in uh, refining aspects of our identity, for instance. Mm -hmm. And, and, and connected to that, uh, I know that you're also interested in matters of intersectionality. Yes. So, 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 so is there in this material any, yeah, structural or intersectional, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, issues or elements that you will point to here? Absolutely. There are a lot of intersectional um, dynamics that are relevant to the travel experiences described in my sources. So perhaps not surprisingly, gender and socioeconomic situation matter a lot. Certain forms of travel are rather gendered, for instance, soldiers versus prides, moving because mm. of marriage uh, arrangements, or for instance, if you want to be a tourist, you need resources. So socioeconomic um, yeah, background matters greatly in terms of some some forms of travel, but then of course the socioeconomic situation can also change uh, because of a relocation, for instance, as a forced migrant or as a war captive. But in addition to, to these quite obvious intersecting differences, there are others. Age and ethnicity, for, for instance, are quite integral to, to the stories of sexual slavery, for instance. And then perhaps some intersectional differences that are often overlooked in gender studies, for instance, kinship, so the importance of family relations, mm. and also religion. Um, so both of these factors can kind of support or fail the, the people on the move, and that's something um, that hasn't been perhaps acknowledged in, in gender studies, but, but my sources certainly invite us to reflect on the importance of, of um, yeah, some additional intersectional differences. Okay, thank you. And finally you, Felix. <laughs> So also thank you for uh, for taking us into your very uh, vivid and eye-opening reading of the Old Testament. And one of the things that I learned by 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 reading your work, which I did when we were um, reading your nomination, was the way that you um, fruitfully combine reading the Bible with with a more literary approach, more than more than a historical approach. Uh, and I think what was one of the things that fascinated me at that time was how you rearticulated exile and diaspora as as not only a, a special experience but as a more profound experience of uh, of suffering and alienation for humans. And I would in this add also that exile and migration is also um, 
or today, it's also an effect of, of climate crisis uh, and catastrophes, not only for humans, but also for beluga whales or for mm. birds or bees or, or, or other uh, creatures. So, so I would like to um, ask you to elaborate a bit upon in, in what ways the Bible is relevant for the contemporary debate of climate catastrophe. Uh, on the perspective of nature and our entanglement with uh, with the more than human, the animals, for instance, and just to hint a bit a bit more on this, and I hope you can follow me. How how may the Bible? I think you you showed it a bit, but I would like you to to elaborate upon it. How may the Bible help us to to decenter man, uh, the human, whilst while still centering on man's responsibility? Mm. Yeah. 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 Mm. <coughs> um, well, thank you yeah. uh, for that, and uh, I'm happy I'm next to you because you did mention, and, and I think that's that's at least one point about relevance that in order to understand uh, Western thought, you need the Bible mm. because the centuries you're working on somehow has to do with the biblical worldview, and it's uh, it seems to be an organic development uh, from a religious heritage tradition to the development of, of modern science, placing man in the center of, uh, of everything. Uh, and, and I referred in my talk to, to a quite famous article in the 60s by uh, Lynn White called The Historical Root of uh, Our Ecological Crisis. And the idea in that article is that, uh, that Christianity, especially in its Western form, given this um, development, uh, uh, has uh, has put man in center uh, and uh, and emphasized development all the time development so uh, so that's at least one way one one place I see the relevance of the Bible yeah. understanding the de the development of uh, European thought uh, and the second one could be quite contemporary uh, in fact um, um, uh, the 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 role the Bible has for many people today. Mm in our part of the world, uh, to a lesser degree perhaps, but to a high degree, many other places in the world. Uh, in Denmark, for instance, the church is the uh, third largest land holder. So reflecting on nature in the Bible and uh, discovering that we have different voices speaking about the same topic, as I tried to show okay. uh, in my talk, uh, uh, where uh, the... the um, uh, probably the mo the most uh, the best known one in Genesis one and the creation account placing man in center is just one mm. and one voice um, uh, among others, and we could go to Psalm one hundred four for instance to um, to find a, a quite different way of talking about it. Mm. Mm. But it's it's also interesting this part about the responsibility of man. One 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 thing is man, and the other thing is the responsibility. And okay, <laughs> and what we haven't talked so much about in, in your talk was uh, disasters as such, and uh, and we have been mailing a bit the two yeah. of us yeah. around uh, around uh, about disasters, and and I was thinking, okay, yeah, building a boat like Noah, mm. yeah, yeah, <laughs> that, yeah. Is, that is one fiction in in the in the Bible, or one story in the Bible, um, and with a certain kind of I could say anthropocentric agency. But on the other hand, it's also a kind of interspecies survival, which is going on here. Yep. So you, you may start in another story, but, 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 but is there these kind of, yeah, more, well, man's responsibility and the interspecies, and, and, and uh, the question of interspecies, corporations or survival, where is, could we find other examples of that in the Bible? I could develop a bit on on the flood story. Yeah, well, I would in, love that. Uh, in, uh, uh, because it's um, it's probably one of the best known stories <laughs> in the Old Testament, and it, it seems quite paradoxically. Mm. I mean, my old children have images of of Noah, his ship, and all the animals, but in, it's a, it's a story about mass destruction, isn't it? Uh, I mean, the the opening is that that the, the world or the earth has been corrupted by mm. by evil and by by humans. And uh, and uh, the only uh, thing left to do is simply to to recreate. So it's it's also a story about recreation or renewal. Mm -hmm. And in order to create a new world, you need to com 
to completely destroy the world you, 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 that exists. Um, so and and the um, the ship uh, represents then the, the 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 only place you survive in such a catastrophe, but a selection of a carefully selection uh, of of humans, righteous humans, no one his family, and animals. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> so provoked by by man, by humans. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But also with a certain responsibility. Have you heard you want to say anything? No, I just feel like yeah. so that would have been like the Bible's version of Elon Musk. Let's <laughs> <laughs> we destroyed this thing. Let's yeah. move on yeah. to the next thing. That's very interesting. Mm. Uh, but I like the uh, uh, Aviara that that you uh, that you touched upon the the question of mental health, mm. so, and you and you spoke about hope in your own talk, and that's perhaps a place where the Bible does may um, does have some kind of relevance for some people at least mm. as as a book of hope mm. and, uh, mm. and it um part of of this event today is is to discuss counter narratives and um, i think your distinction between this problem based approach to the world where you only see problems um it it will lead to this sad and uh, depressing uh, way of mm. Of 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 viewing your own existence, mm. whereas focusing on on strength mm. and uh, the well, um, the fascinating elements in the world that that mm. do exist could could be the a start of a counter narrative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and I like your your um, um, your thoughts about this word silite. It's uh, I, I don't know Elisa, but it's it's very close to biblical Hebrew, isn't it? That that you have a, a I, 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 in, in biblical Hebrew, we have the word nefesh, for instance, mm. which has a lot of different uh, meanings close to this, connecting mm. biological experience. It, it refers, in fact, to this part, mm. of this body mm -hmm. part. But it's also mm. soul and uh, even a kind of self. Mm. But not a soul detached from body or mm. uh, material. No, 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 yeah. No. So yeah. Yeah. We have a similar concept in Greenlandic, too, that's not sila, but yeah, with the breath. Yeah, yeah. yeah with the breath, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not very nice. Very interesting. That's really interesting. And in psychology, we will talk about the affective atmosphere and and the moods and so on. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So maybe this is where we could have a question from the audience here. Very quiet audience. No. Yeah. There's a mic coming up for you. And could you yeah. oh. could you start by presenting yourself? Yeah, uh, just uh, your name and affiliation, please. Yeah, I'm Esker. I'm at the University of Copenhagen. Um, I want to pose a question for Abiyaya. Um, I find what you do really interesting. And there's been this huge movement the last couple of years, maybe. It's it's been going on for longer, but it's become very hip now to try and subvert these um, this scientism or the very um, objective knowledge systems systems that we have, that we sort of have based the modern Western uh, world on. But it's mostly within the, within, mostly anthropology, actually. And there's this one person, Anna Tsing, who does it really well, I think. But to me, I'm in political science. I, I, I find that you can never really translate it into um, both democratic outlook and academic um, methodology, really. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. you do seems to really do the latter. Like you, you actually change what you do and the, the, the very um, methods you use. Do you think there's, there's a, that what you do leads to a subversion of the normal um, STEM <laughs> approach to the world? or can it can it be accommodated the the things that you find need to be accommodated like cultural and experiential things mm. just to put it so vaguely wow. do you know what i mean almost yeah. maybe yeah. <laughs> thank you for a great you. comment and questions that i hopefully understand um 
So I, in sort of within indigenous ways of understanding, there's a great encouragement of thinking both and. And that helps me a lot to not have to choose one or the other, but actually being able to keep both things at once. Um, and I think there are several ways that this can happen, and, and no one person or entity or project needs to do just one of those ways. And what I alerted to before is that you can still have classic objective STEM, but if you have a scientist who views the world in a different way, they will use the methodology differently. So that's one way. And then, so with the biology, are not assuming classical silos. And that's something that goes beyond just another person doing STEM, but also challenging uh, the conventions of STEM. So saying, well, genetics is very closely linked to everything around it, even things that are not necessarily usually taught in biological sciences. So I think we're doing both of those things. And I, I, highly, and I think that's the development that I encourage and hope will, will shape STEM in the future. I, I hope that answers a little bit. Thank you. We will have time for a short question and a short reply before the closing remarks. Yes, please. Thank you. Charles Locke, I'm professor of English here at Copenhagen. Uh, I was going to ask a VIA question, but I'll be, have to be fair to the others, but I'll take up your point uh, that students of science are not taught that scientists have a world view. Are students of hum humanities, or indeed theology, or, or yes, I think that covers the rest of you, yeah. the three of you, uh, taught uh, that you have a worldview? Uh, from uh, listening to your papers, I was thinking, well, listening to your presentation, I think, well, this is all very Protestant. Yeah, huh? You look back on the Old Testament, and we know that's the Old Testament, and we, we know that that's been invalidated, and we look back to it, and so on. Or indeed, looking back to Romanticism, there's a similar sort of model of progress involved. And now we move on to Enlightenment. And of course, Enlightenment is Protestantism, is the modern Danish ideo the, the modern ideology of contemporary Danish universities, and indeed, contemporary universities in the Western world, most of them. Uh, so I, I would like to interrogate your well, your own sense of the worldview as an enabler or an inhibitor of how you do your work. Yeah. Thank you. Short answers only. <laughs> Short answer. Does anyone want to begin? Mm -hmm. Simona? I'll try to, to keep short. Thanks for that fantastic <laughs> <laughs> question. Um, well, difficult one to, to give a, a, a great answer to. Uh, if I'm indeed stuck in my own worldview, so I'm not able to maybe <laughs> go beyond and and see um, but but I do try to I guess uh, even if the 18th century is also uh, indebted to Protestantism I do try in my work to think beyond the disciplinary boundaries as well and and that's what we're trying to do with the uh, interrelationship between science and fiction and that's something that that hasn't been been done before so in that sense I I try to uh, I'd like to think that that uh, that I've moved um, a bit beyond um, the, the 18th century Protestantism view, um, but um, this is this is my uh, take uh, and, and my approach to um, yeah, to try to find a way to to think it in new uh, in new ways. Do you want to pick it up? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, just very briefly. Um, thank you for the, for the question. So, in brief, I can't read my sources without thinking about word views. Of course, today I was. Um, yeah, talking about a text written in Greek language, so it's perhaps yeah closer to us um, culturally in some ways. Although I come from Finland, I'm also not speaking indo european language as my mother tongue. But for the most part, I work on texts written in Semitic languages. So already that um, reading a, a text that is written in an Indo-European language, it requires me to to deconstruct things all the time. And and now yeah, Frederick just um, cited uh, Genesis one. Um, that text, every time I introduce it to a student, a um, new group of students, we need to talk about shell and netherworld and a whole different cosmology and, and worldview. So in many ways, I don't think I could yeah, read my sources without thinking about 
uh, yeah, different worldviews, um, also more animistic uh, conceptions of the of the world. Even though that the, the text example I today talked about perhaps did not communicate that. Do you want to answer, or do you want to put this into your closing remarks, which we are about to to head at? Yeah. Okay, so um, Simona, do you have any closing remarks before we end this panel? Um, well, I just want to, uh, I guess, repeat my thank you uh, and also extend it to you and, and my fellow panelists. Uh, uh, as I said in the beginning, I'm really not an, an expert uh, on uh, climate change and I don't pretend to be one, but um, this symposium has uh, pushed me forward in, in, the, in a new direction and, and made me think about the importance also for worldviews, uh, and I do think that the humanities have a very important uh, role to play uh, in our views uh, of, the, of the planet and, and planetary issues, and mm -hmm. this has made me think uh, a lot more about that, uh, and I hope to be uh, doing so in the future as well, um, and I think those would be my final remarks for today, so thank you. Thank you. And Elisa? Yes, um, thank you very much for the yeah, insightful papers and, and the thoughts. I think I will be digesting this event for a long time, but maybe just two um, brief thoughts, one inspired by um, the discussion between Rote and Frederick uh, regarding interspecies questions. I think that's something I will be thinking about because also the, the story about Noah and destruction and the covenant that is made after that, it's an interspecies covenant. It doesn't concern just Yahweh and Noah and people, but also animals are involved. Um, and also even before that, or when in Genesis 3, the serpent as a clever animal who has uh, knowledge and wisdom and mm -hmm. understanding that the humans don't have. So I think there is a a lot also in in the ancient Hebrew sources um, to think not just intersectionally but also interspecies. And then another brief thought related to or inspired by Avias and and Simona's reflections on nature and also this question of um, different types of nature and uh, yeah moving beyond some kind of black and uh, white or overtly romanticizing. Uh, notion of nature, because I must say that uh, it's a little bit difficult for me to even understand this idea that humans would somehow, after enlightenment, we humans would have been separate from nature. So coming from Finland, um, I grew up 200 kilometers uh, south of the Arctic Circle, not in, a, in, in, in not in the countryside, in a city of around 200,000 people, so not uh, any kind of metropolis, but a major city in the Finnish context. And, and uh, certainly nature was everywhere. Nature started from my parents' uh, backyard. And, and also, I think for, if I, I think I can speak that for most of us Finns, like forest and um, sauna would be also some sort of sacred uh, places. So, so it's a little bit, um, I'm not sure if I buy this whole, whole narrative of some kind of Western worldview where, where nature and and the humans are, are separated, at least it doesn't correspond to my own experience of growing up in, in Northern Europe. And, and perhaps that also invites us to think about these local forms of um, knowledge and how our Nordic, um, yeah, uh, Nordic experiences actually, I'm not sure how representative of some kind of Western uh, experience they are mm. in general. Mm. Something to think about, something to reflect upon. <laughs> Can I continue from this plan? Exactly. That would be great, because that resonates a lot with what I wanted to say. I want to say thank you. I've been really inspired by, by your talks today. Um, and I, d I wanted to tie it back to this about the planetary crisis that we face and the solutions for that. And um, one point that I want to make sure to, to make today is that when we want to work with a strength-based approach, is it also means to realize that other peoples have strengths and other ways of seeing the world, and they have their own solutions mm. that fit to their local environment, and they know their local environment mm. and have emotional attachment to that. Um, so I, uh, something that's very important for me is that we really move away from this thought of trying to make universal solutions and planetary mm. solutions. We might have planetary crises, but I uh, have very difficult in... in 
believing that we can find solutions that are planetary. We need to trust people to be able to make solutions in their own places, even as for us, if it means having an animal source diet, which is something that's very much in contrast to planetary or Western ideas about sustainability. Thank you, Abiyaya. And Frederick, yeah, not your you. last yeah, word, but your same, question. Same, I guess you have <laughs> said it already, <laughs> but there are uh, <coughs> in, uh, two things that I bring back home. The one is the, the different definitions of, uh, of nature and how we should really be, be um, aware of uh, how, how do we imagine a, uh, a forest? Mm. Is it like this or this? Or mm. This? Mm. Yes, uh, and second, uh, listening to you and uh, your reflections from Greenland and um, mental health among students and how to connect that, I think. Yeah, very inspiring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Thank you for giving us perhaps new, not new minds, but new ideas, new pictures to think with, new concepts to think with, new stories to think with. Thank you to the viewers at the camera in the, or in the camera. Thank you to the audience, and thank you to Nils Klim and the Nils Klim Prize. So, thank you. Thank you.